Today is July the 10th, 2017. My name is Tanya Pincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University. And today we are in the Angie DeBow room here in the library on campus of in Stillwater. And I'm just speaking with Matt Fullerton and I will attempt to get his position correct. Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation is where you work. Mm -hmm. And you're the wildlife biologist and specifically involved with endangered species. Yes, ma'am. Got it right. And this is part of our Spotlight in Oklahoma project with an emphasis on monarchs. So thank you for coming today. I'm glad to be here. Let's uh, start with learning a little bit about you. Uh, when and where were you born? So I was born in Oklahoma City in 1982. Okay. And, and tell me a little bit about your parents. So my dad it was born and raised in Chickasha. My mom was born and raised in Oklahoma City. Um, my dad works for the state right now. He works for um, Oklahoma Management Enterprise Services, which is kind of over like financial stuff. And he works specifically with computers and IT. My mom is retired, um, lives in Dibble on kind of some property, 15 acres. My dad still lives in Oklahoma City, so. And you have brothers and sisters? So I have two stepbrothers. Um, so my parents are divorced and, and my mom got remarried. I have two stepbrothers I grew up with, but I am technically the only child. Okay. And typical spoiled only child? No. Well, <laughs> <laughs> depends on who you ask. We won't go there. Yeah. So were your parents, they were born here, did their, were their parents also or did they? Yes, yeah. Here? So as far as I can think, yeah, they, they were, I think they were all born here. Grandparents and great grandparents. Okay, do you know where they might have come from before when the family initially came to the So I believe I have Irish and Scottish in my bloodline, um, but you know, I have never really done any kind of genealogy tracking. I always wanted to, but I really never have. My last name is supposed to be of Scottish descent, so. I was curious if they were, if you could trace it back to one of the land runs. Yeah, and I don't have that kind okay. of information. That's I should, but I don't. That's, that's, <laughs> fine. that's fine. And tell me about your education. Where did, where did you go to elementary school in Orcas? Okay, so I went to elementary school at Red Oak Elementary, which is in the Moore School District. So it's technically, it's I believe in Oklahoma City, but it's in the Moore School District. And then I went to Brink Junior High. Um, so, so grew up uh, near Moore in, uh, I guess, like Southwest Oklahoma City. And then went to Westmore High School and graduated in 2000. And so when I started college, I sort of had kind of a long and illustrious uh, undergraduate career. I started out kind of um, in zoology and then people sort of talked me out of that and said, what are you going to do with that with a job? And I never really had a clear picture of what I wanted to do at that point. Then I just I knew what I loved which was wildlife and animals and ecology. So I started out in zoology, had people talk me out of it, switched to business, got a business degree. This was all at Oklahoma City Community College. Then started at OSU and then, well, before I started at OSU, I realized, okay, I wanna get into natural resources. I, I learned about the, the natural resource ecology and management uh, program at OSU. So started at OSU, uh, graduated in 2011. Recently. Yeah, so pretty recent. And then, um, yeah, so graduated from there and started interning uh, for the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation that following summer. And here you are. Yeah, here I am. So. Well, what got you interested in wildlife initially? That's a good question, you know, because neither one of my parents are outdoorsy people. Um, so, you know, I was a city kid, but I was always playing in creeks. I was always um, catching frogs, lizards, snakes, whatever I could find, bringing them home, putting them in aquariums. Um, I mean, that was just what I did and have always done that. And But it was never really something I was... Uh, exposed to by one of my parents. Um, I think my dad would have preferred I had gone into IT or something, but it's just, this is just something I've always just been passionate about. I don't, you know. Did, did go hunting when, as a yeah. So, so I did hunt some. So, so uh, when my mom remarried my stepdad, he is a big outdoorsman and a hunter. And so really, so when I was probably uh, an older teenager is when he kind of got me out and taught me how to you know, use guns and hunt. And so he, he typically hunts about every year for deer and learned how to dove hunt, use a shotgun. And so, so yeah. 
but didn't really grow up hunting, really. Well, in high school, what was your favorite subject? Yeah, high school. You know, in high school, I, I, I always loved animals, but I was kind of a slacker in high school, really. Um, you know, I was kind of, uh, you know, into video games. It was, like, it was like I liked video games, but then I still loved animals and would still, you know, read up on different things. I always had a lot of books and things like that. So I guess, you know, science, I was always interested in science in high school, um, you know, biology, but... You know, thinking of biology for the end of the, the Yeah, and you know, and that's... Whatever. That really didn't interest me all that much. Because, you know, when I was younger, people always said, you should be like a veterinarian, you love animals. And it was always like, well, I mean, you know, dogs and cats are okay, and I guess cutting frogs open is okay. But I really wanted to just, you know, learn about you know, animal behavior and how animals fit into ecosystems and communities and that sort of thing, so. So animals, not cats and dogs, what specifically, what's your, what, what, got, what animal got you interested? You know, I, I was, I've always been interested in creepy crawlies and I think that's kind of where I started out. Um, and then birds, I really, I've always liked birds also. And I've still to this day, my two favorite animal groups are probably like reptiles and amphibians and then birds. So that's, you know, and I'm always listening for birds and trying to identify birds. The Roadrunner has a unique sound I've heard lately. Yeah, it's yeah, kind of a cooing. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't quite sure what it was for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you've got to know quite a bit about parts and, and behavior, like you said, too. Mm -hmm. So once you graduate from OU, I mean OSU, Watch Easy now. Yeah, watch that definitely. In 2011. Mm -hmm. Then what? So, so uh, I, I guess my, um, my my last year as an undergrad, I was I was very much I decided I want to work for the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. It was sort of like like I really was focused on how do I get on with this agency, and so I learned about internships, and so. My senior year, I got um, I, I learned about an internship that was down at an area in southwest Oklahoma called the Hack Bay Flat Wildlife Management Area, which is which is a piece of land that, that we own and manage. It's a big wetland area. There's lots of birds down there, so I put in for that and got that. And I moved down there to the little town of Frederick, Oklahoma, and uh, and my wife, you know, so so I am married. My wife was like, "You're, you're crazy, you know. You're, you're going to make peanuts and go down there." But I but I knew that. You know, I wanted to get on full time. This is how you have to do it. You have to get your hands dirty and and show that you're you're willing to do all kinds of you know less than favorable jobs, and that's what I did. So I did that. So the summer of 2011, I went down there and I worked down there. And got a lot of experience. Learned how the how the agency works and got to help out with. <clears throat> so I. I um, help with uh, vegetation management so they do a lot of uh, there's like invasive trees that grow down there trees that aren't desirable and then I so I used herbicide on a lot of those and then I helped to uh, trap bobwhite quail for a study that was going on and then helped helped uh, trap and ban morning doves down there so I got a lot of exposure on how the agency works and yeah that's how I got my foot in the door and I'm assuming some of what you learned at, at OSU transferred over into the Definitely, program. definitely, yeah. In fact, like my senior year, I took a, like a wetland management class, and then when I went down there, it was, that's a big, you know, wetland unit, and so I was able to take a lot of that knowledge. And so I do, I do feel um, I'm very thankful for the education I had here, and then I was able to apply it, you know, directly to my job, and still do to this day, um, you know, draw on things I learned here at OSU. You don't think of Oklahoma as having a wetland. You don't, you don't, especially down in southwest Oklahoma, it's so dry down there. Um, but, you know, that area down there was basically a restored area that was historically just this great big wetland that has been known about for hundreds of years. And so the settlers, you know, wrote stories about it. So, hmm. interesting. A lot of history down in that area. Rattlesnakes? There are rattlesnakes down there. <laughs> That's what I think of is when I'm arid and dry mm -hmm. snakes mm -hmm. and scorpions, I guess. Yeah, scorpions, plenty of that. So how long did you stay there? So I was down there, let's see, I'm trying to think. It was late fall of 2011. 
but I was down there. And then after my internship ended, so there was there was a period where, you know, of course I wasn't working for the agency and I had a, had a part-time job at a convenience store in Oklahoma City, but I was like putting in for different jobs as they were coming open. And so I interviewed for a biologist job that was at Keystone, wildlife management area. And uh, didn't get that, but um, did get to go in for the interview and, you know, kind of hopefully was able to show that I've attempted to prepare for this interview. And then in, I believe it was April of 2012, I interviewed for a job where I was working with, with uh, landowners in Northwest Oklahoma on the Lesser Prairie, Lesser Prairie Chicken. And so it was like... Um, working with landowners on uh, enrolling in programs where they could restore prey chicken habitat and while, while still having like a, like a ranch operation or, you know, still, they can still have cattle and, and do their usual thing. And so that was my first like full-time job at the agency is doing that in 20, it was, I believe it was May in 2012 was when I started with that. So from the Southwest to, <laughs> to the Northwest. To Tulsa to, mm -hmm. well, not to Tulsa, that's where you'd be, Keystone, mm -hmm. Keystone. Mm -hmm. Quite a change in. It was, yeah. So, and I had never lived down in Southwest Oklahoma. I'd never lived in Northwest Oklahoma. So, it was, you know, not a huge culture shock, but something very different from someone who's always lived in Oklahoma City. Oh, the terrain is different. Terrain, yeah, very much so. Yeah. And just lots of different flora and fauna. Well, what is the deal with this lesser prairie chicken? Well, so at the time, that I was hired, the lesser prairie chicken was a, a federal candidate species. And so that, that means that it's a species that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is um, reviewing for potential listing under the Endangered Species Act. But it's essentially kind of put in this category where it's uh, considered um, possibly warranted for listing, but it's like precluded due to um, like maybe there's higher listing priorities or maybe they need more information on it. So. They know it's there's a problem there, but maybe it's not in complete and imminent threat of uh, you know being exterminated or, or extinction. Um, and so at that time, you know, I was I was kind of working as a sort of a liaison. So my position was I was a liaison between basically ODWC and the Natural Resource Conservation Service to kind of help implement. Um, the NRCS's cost share programs, like for landowners. And so it was like trying to get landowners, like, you know, we can offset the costs of restoring prey chicken habitat on your land, you know, to try to like boost the population numbers across the range. So you have to be a good talker. Yes, yeah, yeah. Your, it's, business, and it was, your business background might come in handy there. Yeah, maybe, but you know, it's a challenge because, you know, me not coming from like a ranching background and trying to reach kind of this, this agricultural sector, you know, that's kind of a challenge really, you know, and it's, and you can't go to, you can't go to somebody's, to a landowner and, and tell them what to do on their land. You just, that just does not fly, you know. You have to, you know, kind of listen to them and understand their situation that they're trying to make ends meet. And this is like their backyard, you know, and you're, so it's 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 just it's it's um it's an acquired skill for sure to try to work with landowners and it's just it's very important to try to find meet their needs while also trying to meet what what your objective. Well, is the prairie chicken on endangered or is it still? So it's it's sort of in a weird limbo period right now. Um, so it actually was listed in I believe twenty. 13, it was listed as threatened. And so you have basically like two levels in the endangered species. Like you have threatened species and you have endangered species. So threatened means that it's, it's uh, in danger becoming endangered in the foreseeable future. And endangered is, it is in danger of becoming extinct. And so obviously endangered is like, like a higher level of, of um, severity. And so it was listed as threatened. Um, which is kind of like we were trying to preclude that from happening, you know, and it got, it did get listed. And then there was a lawsuit in Texas that actually removed it off the list, but it's under review again for possible, possible being re-added to the list. So it's kind of in this weird, it, it's always been sort of a point of contention because it's a species that, you know, potentially impacts uh, like oil and gas development and things like that. So I should probably go into a little bit about the biology of the prey chicken. So, so the lesser prey chicken historically evolved in a landscape that was just basically just wide open prairie. 
with like very few trees. And so it's interesting because every spring the males will gather on what are called leks. And so the males will, will gather and they, they'll display and they have these, they, these throat sacks that they, that they blow up and they have these feathers that pop up on top. And you know, the, m many of the Native Americans sort of um, uh, imitated their, their behavior in some of their, their uh, traditional dances with some of these. So, um, so yeah, so let's approach is a is a grouse. And so grouse, this is like a common grouse behavior. So they come together on legs, the males display, and then like the dominant male typically gets kind of in the center of the leg, and he, and the, so the females come and they're attracted to the, uh, what are these, these booming grounds where they, they make all this, this racket and they do these funny dances. And the, the dominant male will mate with uh, most of the females that come to the leg. And the, the trick about these leks is they are typically kind of on a higher, kind of a higher area, maybe like a ridge or kind of a higher hill along the prairie, so that the birds can kind of see across the landscape for um, to avoid predators. So, so hawks, you know, will definitely will will hunt them and eat them. Um, probably, you know, coyotes and other species like that. And so, what has happened over time is. So, so they've evolved in this very open landscape, no trees, and what's happened over time is that with fragmentation, people coming in, and uh, so this kind of started with like uh, homesteaders, like setting up like these small plots of land. They've, you know, because they, they, prairie chickens do not tolerate um, d like uh, buildings very well or just human activity very well. I mean, they're just a species. They, they just need like basically just wide open prairie with very few people. They don't, they don't tolerate really human activity. They don't tolerate a lot of noise and they don't tolerate trees very well. So people planting trees and then also people excluding fire from the prairie. So when people moved into the prairie, they, they would stop fires from happening. So like historically, you would have fires kind of going across the landscape and burning thousands of acres, which that would basically keep, that keeps the, the prairie healthy, that keeps the grass growing, and it also keeps trees from growing on the prairie, typically, unless they're like, except for like kind of in like these areas where fire can't get to, like maybe some creeks or um, some ravines and whatnot. And so people with a combination of just development and suppressing fire, it's, it's you know, it's, you basically have direct loss of prairie habitat and then you have like trees that have like basically um, encroached on the prairie. Eastern red cedar is one of them. And because of that, prairie, prairie chickens have just declined. You know, they, they, just don't, they just can't really tolerate that. And so you don't have just a, a whole lot of just sort of like these wide open, unfragmented grasslands left. So that's the main reason why they've they've declined. And so, you know what you know what I would do when I would meet with landowners is I would try to encourage like like if they had some like non-native grass in an area, I would try to encourage them to plant like native grass. Or if they had a lot of cedar trees, I would encourage them to you know like remove mechanically remove their cedar trees like with a chainsaw or some kind of equipment. And then also try to implement like a, a like a fi prescribed fire program. Which you know, and fire is a hard thing to sell um, to ranchers, you know. But it's 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 a natural part of the the prairie landscape. And so if they don't like trees, they probably don't like the wind turbines. Or they the... definitely don't like the wind turbines. That, that's another that's another issue. Um, and I and I don't know. There, there's a lot of theories about that. Um, so w one of the theories with trees and wind turbines is that prairie chickens avoid basically just vertical structures. With and, and you know, it used to you know it used to people thought it's to avoid you know because hawks will perch on things you know and look for prey, and the the thought was that prairie chickens are avoiding these tall structures. Um, you know, because they might be a hawk perch, and I don't, and, and me personally, I don't know if it's necessarily that, or if it's just the whole, all the commotion that goes along with wind turbines, you know, all the people coming and going and vehicles and all the noise. Um, I feel like it's just a combination of things um, that just drive people out. And the same with oil and gas wells, you know, I feel like, you know, with all the just the activity of putting the well in and all the, you know, there's lights on at night when they're constructing it, I just feel like that just, just, you know, drives birds away. Was Oklahoma one of the main areas for the lesser chicken? Well, so Oklahoma is one of five states where the lesser prairie chicken lives. So there's, you know, you've got um, so Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado, 
Texas and New Mexico. Okay. And, and I, I think that most of them are in Kansas. That's probably where, Kansas probably has the most number of birds. Um, we, we probably currently have, um, most of our, our birds are probably in about three counties in Northwest Oklahoma. Really? Yeah, and historically they were, they're thought to historically have occurred over the western third of the state. So before, so the thought is that, you know, before European settlement, you know, the western third of the state was basically just like all grassland. And so that you had prairie chickens just all across that band. What's I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. How, about, how, how big is one? See, I think they're about two and a half pounds. So, you know, I've never held one, but I think they're about like that. You know, they're not, not a very big bird. Just, um, it's just, they're just a fascinating bird. They really are because even though they're, they're a, oh, a relatively large bird, I mean, you just, you just don't see them on the landscape and they just, you know, when they hunker down in the grass, they're like the color of the grass. And really, so the only time you really see them is during the lecking season. If you can find one of these booming grounds and you can watch them, which is pretty incredible to see. It really is. Well, do they have, do they serve a purpose in the ecosystem? That is a good question. You know, I've had people ask me, well, what happens if prairie chickens disappear? What does that mean? And, and I guess I, my, I would say the prairie chicken is well, first of all, of course, it's an important piece of biodiversity, but then also I feel like it is a, it's an indicator species. And I feel like if prairie chickens are not on the landscape, it's an indication that something is wrong or, or you're starting to see something wrong on the landscape. I would think transferring that to monarchs, it would be the same thing. Yes, an indi say so. Indicator species. Yeah, I would say so, for sure. I mean, because it, it's, it's hard, the challenge I, I'll, I'll have in my field, and, we'll, and anyone else who works, you know, with a lot of these species that are kind of generally unknown, is you, know, you have people ask you, what what good are they, you know, and what's, you know, why do we have these, and if they're gone, then what? It's like, well, I mean, it's like I appreciate them just because I appreciate them, but that is that that's difficult. That's kind of frustrating to try to convey the importance of a lot of these rare and declining species to the general public. Other than to show this is just an important piece of biodiversity, and if it goes extinct, it's what's next? Yeah, what's it's next? it's gone forever. So. Okay. So then, you did that for a little while, and then moved into. So yeah, so yeah, so so I did. I was in that position for about two years, and then in 2014. Um, our agency was working, so we, we had the prey chicken we were working on, and then we had another species called the American bearing beetle. So this, the American bearing beetle is an endangered insect that, and, and in Oklahoma, we have the largest population of them in the, you know, in the country. And again, it's federally endangered, and this is another one of these unique species. It's, it's, a, it's a very large, uh, very beautiful beetle, really black with red spots and they and they live underground during the day and what they do is at night they look for a carcass you know like a dead bird a dead rat something like that and, and whenever they're, they're ready to lay eggs they will try to find a pair a pair of these beetles will, will find a carcass and they will actually pull all the hair off or the feathers off and they'll roll it up into a ball and they'll actually bury it into the ground lay their eggs inside of it. It sounds disgusting, but it's actually pretty fascinating. They'll lay their eggs inside of it, and the larvae will basically like eat this carcass and then develop and come out. So. And that's why it's called the burying. The burying like beetle, they're, yeah. They bury their. Yeah, they're burying, and it's and it's uh, it's one of uh, oh several dozen beetles in that family, and they all kind of do the same thing. They all kind of bury carcasses and feed on dead things and. American burying beetles and another species that few people have seen just because they're they're underground and. Even though they're in some pla in some places, they're pretty common. Um, you know, mo most of them are in sort of the um, south central part of the state. Um, so, uh, like Pittsburgh County, uh, Matoka County, Pushmataha County. Um, you know, there, there's that's where most of them are. They kind of like um, kind of a mixed woodland prairie um, woodland area. Um, and it seems like the limiting factor for them is suitable soil to bury in. So you won't find them in areas where there's a lot of sandy soil or really thick clay or things like that. Does something feed on them? 
Yeah, I think yeah, I think anything would feed on them. I think uh, birds probably eat them. Uh, but probably more than anything, you probably have small mam like um, possums, skunks probably feed on them quite a bit. Do we um, have them in Payne County? They have not been found in Payne County. Um, they, that's not to say they could be in Payne County. If they are, they would be like in the very far east, east portion. But I feel like Payne County is probably a little too sandy. The soil is probably too sandy for them. Okay. Um, but, but anyway, so, so at the, so in 2012, um, or in, so probably starting in 2012, I mean, the Beatles have been listed since 1989, but things, but it really started to, um, you know, um, just like the prairie chicken, you know, it, it impacts um, a lot of oil and gas development and this and that. So it's been a species of controversy. And at the time that it was listed, it was only known from basically three sites. So it was known from like uh, two counties in Oklahoma and then, and then in Rhode Island. So this is interesting. So this is a species that historically was, was found over basically like eastern North America. And now it only occurs like in... Uh, like Nebraska, Kansas, uh, Oklahoma, a little bit of Arkansas, and there's a few experimental populations in, I believe, Missouri and Ohio that they, they're trying to reestablish them, and then it's found like in, in Rhode Island, like this area called Block Island. So it's like yeah, all the way across across the country. But anyway, so so our agency, you know, the workload for that was was sort of happening, and it was becoming apparent, like. The agency was like, we, we need like a like kind of a dedicated endangered species person because at that time we didn't. We uh, um, so and I guess this will kind of help explain sort of how I fit in the agency. So I work within um, what's called the Wildlife Diversity Program, and so it's like basically the non-game program. So so most of our agency it primarily devotes resources toward game species. So like you know white-tailed deer, bobwhite quail. Um, elk, wild turkey, and the non-game program has everything else, you know, like the 800 plus species that are in Oklahoma. And so some of those are sort of like the um, common species, like bluebirds and hummingbirds, and then, uh, but a lot of them are like kind of these rare and declining species. And so traditionally that program only had two people in it. So it had like two biologists in it, and they, they, they were kind of tasked with you know, basically kind of managing all of these projects and coordinating different things for just different non-game species, whatever they could kind of work on. And so then it became apparent, you know, the agency basically was like, we need like an endangered species focused person that kind of kind of helps work on these issues like prairie chicken and beetle. And so they created my position in 2014. And then that's when I, I put in for it and got it in May of 2014. So I've been in this position since then. Okay, good. So then... So the beetles and the chickens, and then what else? Are you, what else? So a big part of what I do. So so there is a fund that the Endangered Species Act authorizes by the Fish and Wildlife Service. It's called the Cooperative Endangered Species Conservation Fund. And so what it does is it um, it's, it's a small amount of money that is given to all state wildlife agencies to kind of help them assist in the recovery of federally listed species. And so we get about. Uh, it's roughly about $100,000 a year, and basically we, um, we, we, we meet with the Fish and Wildlife Service and we talk about, um, you know, you know what, what are some projects that we can kind of help them with on different listed species issues. And so we, we may, um, so we have a grant where we help do surveys for um, the Arkansas River Shiner, which is a federally threatened fish that lives in the Canadian River. We have a very long-term project that's going on since 1992 down in southeast Oklahoma where we have a population of endangered woodpeckers called red-cockaded woodpeckers. And we've been helping out with the, so it's, it's a unique situation because you have, all, you have the majority of the birds are on ODWC property. And so we actually have staff that are dedicated spe almost specifically for kind of managing those birds. And so basically all of their time and equipment and everything is basically charged to um, one of these grants, which we call them Section 6 grants for short because it's Section 6 of the Endangered Species Act is what authorizes this fund. 
And so, and so what I do is I basically coordinate all of those projects. And so I um, work with, I kind of um, set up, we have an annual meeting where we, we talk to the Fish and Wildlife Service about different project ideas or um, needs or priorities. Um, what, what's, a, what's a species that we need more information on or, um, or sometimes someone will come to me with, like a, like a professor or a researcher will come to me with a proposal and say, um, we're interested in doing you know, a survey or some kind of a study with this species, and then I'll, you know, meet with the Fish and Wildlife Service, and and we, we sort of like joint, jointly um, kind of review and, and coordinate different things like that. If it's a species you're not real familiar with, how do you go about learning what you need to know? Well, that's tricky, and so... So we have we have uh, so we have species that are listed as threatened or endangered. And then we have like a whole suite of species that maybe the service is considering listing, or or they're they're not like a candidate, but they're well, like a species under review. And so a lot of times, what we want to know is is where are they? Sometimes we just need the fundamentals, like you know where does this species occur in the state right now? Um, we only know of like one record here, and sometimes if you if if someone actually goes out and does like a dedicated survey or search for one of these species, they'll they'll find maybe that they're common, or maybe they'll find they we can't find them anywhere. Um, so a lot of times we're we're kind of at that basic level of just trying to figure out what is the current distribution of of one of these species. Uh, but but most of the species that are listed. As threatened or endangered, there's quite a bit that's known about them. You know, we, we know you know basically where they are in the state, and it's it's uncommon for us to you know, find like a, a place where they are where we didn't find we didn't really have a general idea of where they were before. Um, you know, a lot of species that are threatened or endangered, they they I should say a lot. You know, but a fair number of them are um, they have very high site fidelity. So. Uh, like prairie chickens, you know, they, they typically go back to the same lek about every year. And as long as that, I mean, as long as it might move a little bit, but that, but it, that kind of shows the importance of preserving that lek and, the, and the, the landscape around it because prairie chickens will, will use that lek and they'll, they'll use that surrounding area for nesting and, you know, basic foraging and whatnot. And red woodpeckers, they use uh, specific trees and we know where those trees are. And we know to preserve those trees, not cut those trees down. Um, another endangered bird is the black-capped vireo. It also has so high sight fidelity, so it's like a little songbird, really pretty, kind of a black cap on its head, kind of a kind of a black throat. And they um, they kind of return to the same kind of the same territory every year. So they they migrate. So they're here during spring and summer, and then they they migrate down to Mexico in the fall. But during spring, when they come back, they generally come to about the same area. Um, so yeah, so we kind of a general, we, we, we have quite a bit of information on where the listed species are. The ones that aren't, you know, that those are the ones that we're always trying to get more information on. You go out with a, a camera and a, do an inventory or count or? Yeah, you know, just like a certain, depending on what it is, I mean, if it's, um, you know, obviously insects are kind of are, are a challenge, especially if it's sort of a, a cryptic insect. And you know, another thing that we run into also is um, taxonomy. So perhaps like a species was described by scientists 80 years ago, and then you wonder, well, is it really taxonomically different from this other one over here that we we know quite a bit about? Sometimes it is, sometimes sometimes it isn't. So um, sometimes we have to just figure out. What's the, the validity of this as a species, as a distinct species? It's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, and then, then there's species where they, you know, one species that we're working on right now is the eastern spotted skunk. So the spotted skunk is a species that historically was found almost statewide all over Oklahoma. Um, you know, there's a lot of records to support that. And it seemed to occur just like striped skunks, which are everywhere. It seemed to occur in all different habitat types, and then, oh, probably the 1930s, 40s, it just took the population just took a nosedive, and no one really knows why. Everybody, people have theories. You know, people say, well, you know, it's uh, habitat fragmentation. You know, lots of uh, farming and just basically habitat loss, um, and then some people speculate maybe rabies 
the spread of rabies has caused them to decline, but no one really knows. It's that's sort of a mystery species that we're trying to get information on right now, trying to figure out where are the skunks. And there's really has not been a concerted effort to find them for a long time. So that's something we're we're actually working with the University of Central Oklahoma here in the next three years. They're going to do like a survey down in some parts in southeast Oklahoma to try to find spotted skunks. Are they actually spotted? They are, yeah, they are. They're, they're, they're smaller than a striped skunk. They've kind of got kind of these um, splotches and spots all over them, and they're just a fascinating little critter. Do they spray the skunk? They do, and they say they smell worse than a striped skunk, if you can imagine. So. Is that different from a, is it a civic, civic cat? That's what people um, used to call spotted skunks, actually. That's sort of like a, a term that people would call them. And heard I had to look what that was since yeah. you did so. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So it's a species that you know. If you talk to a lot of old timers, they'll tell you about them. Yeah, you mm -hmm. used to see spotted skunks or we caught them, but they, they're just a species that's just mysteriously declined. Yeah. The other one we've heard about is jackrabbits. That they yeah almost disappeared. Yeah, know. jackrabbits are funny because you, you still find them um in western oklahoma and places but yeah i think that they used to be kind of statewide and i think part of that is just the loss of prairie you know you just lost grassland i mean a lot of species have just taken nosedive well you know i feel like uh you know with monarchs and prairie chickens a lot of this stuff you can attribute to just ch the land use changes over time just habitat loss well, since you mentioned monarchs, we can move into that. How did how did you get on board with with the with the monarch? Market? Well, so so the monarch, what, what really kind of brought the monarch into our radar was so it was <clears throat> it was petitioned for um, a federal listing, and so so one way that species get listed is that um, any entity, scientist, really anybody can petition a species to be listed. So they'll put together like you know basically this long document showing all kinds of um, scientific data, evidence showing, hey, this species is warranted for a listing, and the service is required to review it. And uh, there's actually a lot of species that are sort of like in the queue that the service is sort of, um, you know, a decision is pending on whether it's going to be listed. And the monarch, and I believe it was in 2014, was petitioned for listing, and the service basically kind of made this determination of, well, it's, um, this could be substantial and we need to look into this. And really that's kind of how things started. Um, the, you know, the, and the monarch is such a, uh, I'll, I'll just kind of start off by saying the monarch is so different than really any other species I've ever worked on because of the tremendous interest. Because it's like so many species that I work on, no one knows what they are. You know, you, spotted skunk's a good one. You know, some people know what they are, but most people it's, they don't know what they are. And, and so in terms of, you know, conservation planning or coming up with you know, research ideas. It's like basically it's like on the shoulders of the state wildlife agency to sort of figure out, you know, the where, the what, the how. But with the monarch, I mean, you have every, um, you know, everybody from a, a backyard gardener to, you know, city parks, um, biologists at all different levels. Um, NGOs, you know, non-governmental organizations, I mean, all kinds of groups just have tremendous interest in the monarch. And so, and, and, that, and that is definitely good, but it's also at times overwhelming just to try to figure out who's doing what and pulling it all together, you know. But so, so yeah, so in 2014, when the monarch was petitioned, it's kind of when we, we really were kind of like, oh, you know, something is, is going on with the monarch. And so, Last, let's see, I'm trying to think of the timeline here. So in, in 2016, there was a, a, a state monarch summit. <clears throat> and so if I understand this right, the, the, the National Wildlife Federation um, started putting together these state monarch summits where they would basically just bring all of the statewide players together um, from all these different from across the board to, you know, basically let's pull all of our knowledge of monarchs and then also develop a, a statewide monarch kind of a recovery plan or a conservation plan. And so we, we, we had our state summit in November of, 20, I believe it was November of 2016. And so since then, there's been a group that's formed called the Oklahoma Monarch and Pollinator Collaborative. 
And so we have monthly conference calls. And what we're doing is working on a, a statewide conservation plan. And so it has like a, it's going to have like a habitat goals in it. Um, it's going to have sort of like a, what are we going to do for outreach? Um, what are some research needs for the species? And all of that. And then simultaneously, while the statewide effort's been going on, there's been a national effort. So there is a, there is a group. So, so, so the, there are, there is a, a, um, an agency called the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. It's like this group that I believe all state wildlife agencies belong to. And underneath that, there are sort of these regional breakouts. There's like a Western Association, which is most of the Western states. There's a Southeast Association. And actually, because Oklahoma is sort of in this weird central thing, we are in the Southeast and the Western. Um, associations. So we are also we are so not only are we like a, an, an association, which is an as is AFWA for short. We are also a member of CIFWA, which is the Southeast Association, and WAFWA, which is the Western Association. And yeah, it's <laughs> it, keeping up with them is is fun. But 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 what's nice is the states can pull together on these species across boundaries and pull together and talk about. Uh, we can coordinate different things. So uh, with the Monarch, there, the Midwest Association, which is most of the states kind of in the upper Midwest, um, kind of the Corn Belt states, those states came together and said we need to develop a, a kind of a national uh, Monarch plan and basically pull all the states kind of in the, kind of what's, what's called like the flyway for the Eastern migratory population of Monarchs, which, so you have Monarchs, so most of the monarchs that we're aware of and think about, you know, they, they, um, most of their summer range is kind of in the upper Midwest. Um, so like the Dakotas and Iowa and Indiana, those states up there. And then uh, that, that's, that's where most of the milkweed historically was, and that's where most of them bred. And then in Oklahoma, they just basically mi are migrating through during spring and fall. So we're kind of like a, like a stopover state. Um, but they but they go up there during the summer they're up there and then they overwinter in Mexico and so but, but then there's also like a separate population kind of on the west coast and then I think there's maybe a, a small population that doesn't migrate like on the east coast and I think there's some monarch populations in some other countries like that maybe were introduced so you've got sort of like you know just because of the popularity of people raising monarchs so I want to say in some of the tropics, maybe Malaysia. I'm kind of blanking on whatever those, what other countries there are. But, but, but yeah. But so what we're focused on that the the population that's declined the most is like what's considered the eastern population of the migratory population of monarchs. And so, so, so they they've so the Midwestern Association has basically um, basically initially reached out to all these states, including Oklahoma, uh, to talk about creating this kind of national plan. So you've got like the state plan, then you've got the national plan. And, and then the idea is that we uh, essentially achieve um, like habitat restoration goals and boost the population to where it will not need to be listed as threatened or endangered. How close is it to be? And I mean, are the numbers that, that low? Well, the, the numbers have declined um, pretty significantly. You know, the, the monarch, like a lot of species, kind of has cycles up and down. But kind of what you see if you look at sort of long-term trends is it's sort of like this. And during in, in, in their overwintering grounds in Mexico, since most of them are concentrated in sort of this one area down there in the mountains, they are susceptible to like extreme weather events. So if there's like a big sort of a, a snowstorm or an ice storm, it can really uh, it can really uh, kill quite a few of them, and and then also with there's just been a tremendous loss of prairie and milkweeds up in, especially in the upper Midwest. I mean, really, there's you know just just like we were talking about the loss of grasslands, but you know up in like uh, the Corn Belt, um, there's just been uh, you know where there traditionally was a lot of uh, milkweed, and so so the the preferred plant, I guess the preferred milkweed of all the milkweeds is what's called the common milkweed. And so it was, um, it, it can grow pretty tall and it's, it probably produces the most, uh, 
the most leaves for the caterpillars. And uh, traditionally, it grew like, you, you know, we have a, some in Oklahoma, like in the northern part, but most of it was kind of in the upper Midwest. But since, since with agriculture, there's been the invention of like Roundup Ready crops. And so, his, so traditionally, like before, before they came out with like Roundup Ready crops, you had milkweeds kind of growing in between the corn rows. And then I think farmers would maybe uh, pull them or spray them, but you still had quite a few growing out there. But see, now I believe the Roundup Ready crops just essentially, you know, kill out the milkweed. Um, and so just, and I think that that has been the primary cause of the decline. It's just the loss of uh, like breeding habitat. And then what's really important for them down here in like what's called like the South Central Plains, like Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas is is uh, nectar sources, so they, they need um, you know wildflowers and plants that are that they can kind of stop over and refuel. And what's interesting, uh, so so Kristen Baum here has you know found that when they're when they're coming down south to Mexico for the winter, the she, you know she's found that quite a few of them are actually uh, breeding here in Oklahoma as they migrate. So they'll actually like stop over on milkweed plants here in Oklahoma and lay eggs and they'll have like kind of an extra generation right before you know late fall and winter so so it seems like plant uh, flowers are more important more important not necessarily but higher priority than milkweed here for oklahoma yeah i mean I, you know i mean we actually have quite a bit of native milkweed here and i would say you know in a perfect situation you've got you know sort of a, a mixture of milkweed and nectar sources but i guess i would say if you had to choose one or over the other the nectar sources are probably more important in oklahoma for monarchs mm -hmm. so they have the energy to sustain migration yeah. to both both northward and southward well then we'll ask that question too so what if we lose them what what's the significance of saving the the monarch. Well, you know, the monarch, from what I've heard, is kind of a poor pollinator. You know, there's actually like, a, you know, they, they say moths are, are better pollinators than a lot of butterflies are. A lot of people think, you know, butterflies are the great pollinators and, and bees are, a lot of bees are better pollinators. What we lose, I mean, I, I don't know what would change if the monarch disappeared on the landscape other than, I mean, because I, I think you know they they're distasteful to a lot of predators I and mean, that's you know their coloration you know they they have um, I think they have a it, that's a signal to predators like they taste bad um, so uh, that's a good question other than it would just be a tremendous loss to biodiversity and just uh, such a, um, a unique species that um, you know flies so many miles and overwinters in Mexico and I mean, I mean, few butterflies, you know, undergo a journey like that. So, what could it translate to that other pollinators would? Definitely that. I mean, I mean, the the what the, the most important thing about the monarch is because it's so recognizable, it really brings to light to the public the importance of pollinators. And I, I, that's what I really like about all the interest in monarchs is because it's sort of like the flagship for other pollinators because everybody recognizes monarchs. I mean, it's like a species that a lot of people learn about, you know, in sixth grade biology or something, you know, about the life cycle of the monarch. So it's such a charismatic species that a lot of these other less charismatic species can really benefit from monarch conservation. Do you recall learning about them in your sixth grade? I think so. Yeah, Maybe. I do. Yeah, vaguely. I mean, I, I mean, I've always been familiar with. I, I know, like when when you go through like the butterfly cycle, I always re remember it's the monarch is always sort of like the species illustrated, learning about caterpillar to chrysalis to adult. What well, do you remember seeing any mass numbers coming through growing up? You know, I, I mean, I, I remember recognizing the monarch as a young age, but you know, just like a lot of things, I just did not pay attention. You know, and even, even um, a few years ago, you know, I would see monarchs and I would make a note of them. But I, you know, now I'm just very much aware of monarchs. I mean, I like when I get one in my yard, I get really excited, like there's a monarch. So I won't get that excited if you found a variant beetle. <laughs> well, I, I, I actually I would get pretty excited if I saw a bearing beetle, but yeah, it's um, 
yeah, but it's it's just it's just a very um, it's a very interesting species and. Well, who are the other players that are coming to the table for this conservation plan for the state? So for the statewide plan, you know, we've got NRCS, we have the, the Oklahoma Farm Bureau. So they're a very important player, um, you know, getting uh, farmers on board with this, or at least, you know, getting them engaged and kind of understanding what's happening. Because, um, you know, Oklahoma is a private land state, and we can, we, we can do very little on public lands. I mean, you know... The Oakland Department of Wildlife Conservation, I think we've managed a little over a million acres, but, um, you know, it's like 90, the state as a whole is, I believe it's over 95% privately owned, maybe a little higher than that. So it's very important to get private landowners on board, ranchers on board, farmers on board. So we've got the Oklahoma Farm Bureau. Um, we have, uh, so, so we have a guy that's assisting, and he is, his name is Ray Morans, and he's like um, sort of a joint NRCS Xerces Society position. So the Xerces Society is like an organization that is, is focused on um, uh, like insect conservation issues. So, so he's helping out with it. Um, we have the Nature Conservancy, um, you know, working on it. Um, uh, we, we have uh, some tribal representation on there. Um, who else do we have? National Wildlife Federation. Um, we, we had the, well, so, so we had, so at, at our Monarch Summit, I mean, we had uh, tremendous turnout there at the summit. We had the Conservation Commission there. Um, we had, oh yeah, so, uh, Oakland Department of Transportation, because the, these rights of way are very important for monarchs. There's a lot of uh, like flowers and milkweeds that grow along like the highway rights of way. So kind of working with them is important. So they're helping out. Um, so yeah, I want to say we have like 15 members, kind of core members on our uh, kind of steering committee that's developing this statewide plan. Um, the University of Oklahoma, they have. Um, this program called the Oklahoma Natural Heritage Inventory. So they're like a, so every state has a natural heritage inventory. Basically what they do is they, they track um, rare species records. And so they're, they're participating also in the statewide plan. When, when, what's the goal of having it finished? Or? Well, so actually the, the first draft is, is scheduled to be completed here in about a month. So here in August, um, and now it's gonna. There's gonna be a lot more that needs to go into it. Um, you know, one of the one of the challenges that that um, we're facing right now is trying to figure out what is a goal because we don't really know what we have right now. So so the monarch is tricky because one plant is beneficial to a monarch. If that plant that plant could be on a curbside, you know, um, but how do you how do you quantify that? That's sort of the the challenge. So like. So like in terms of like a species like the lesser prey chicken, you can come up with some sort of a, a coarse number of native rangeland or grassland. Um, and then you, that's sort of like your, your number that you kind of work off of. Like you say you want to increase that by 20% by you know, 2030 or something. But with the monarch, it's, just, it's, it's challenging to figure out how, what do we have right now and what's our goal and are we going to measure by milkweed plants we're we going to measure by acres because in the upper midwest they are focused on like number of milkweed stems so there's actually like a national sort of a target of 1.8 billion milkweed stems is what's is what's needed um, to recover the monarch population and so down here, you know, we realize that milkweed, it's important, but it's not criti as critical as it is in the upper Midwest. Um, so that's, that's the challenge we're facing right now, just trying to figure out how do we set a goal. Well, if you know how many milkweeds, it'd be hard to say how many flowers you'll need. Yeah, it's just a challenge. And then it's just, it's, it's um, I mean, and I kind of struggle with number of milkweeds too, because, you know, you're sort of just assuming that X number of monarchs are going to be, you know, um, produced from each milkweed. But I mean, it's, I, I understand you have to work with what you have and you have to come up with estimates, but it's, it's just, it's hard. change, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's a challenge. Well, do they share? I mean, just one, are they territorial? I mean, one's 
only one can do per milkweed? Do you well, I, I think that I think that typically, like in Oklahoma, I think a, a monarch lays like an egg on a milkweed plant, and may, may, I might lay like two eggs, and then goes to another milkweed, lays one or two more eggs, and then hops on. That way, it gives like a caterpillar like enough food. Um, but I think in the case of where you have fewer milkweeds, or you have like a highly fragmented landscape, you'll have um, I've heard the term egg dumping. So you have a monarch that lays eggs, flies around, can't find another milkweed, goes back to maybe the one or two milkweed stems, lays more eggs. And so, which may or may not be beneficial to the caterpillars because they run out of food, they're not going to make it to adulthood. So that's why ideally you want sort of like a you know, large area of mixture of nectar plants and milkweeds. So once this initial plan is made, the committee will stay formed until... Yeah, yes, yeah, so the idea is that we'll, you know, convene periodically. Um, so right now we're doing once a month, but it'll probably, once the plan's going, maybe once or twice a year, we'll have a kind of a coordination, kind of a call or a meeting. And then, and then the, hopefully our state plan will fit into the national plan. And I feel like it will to uh, to some extent, but I feel like each state plan is a little different. But you know, I, I I'm all about you know pooling efforts and capitalizing on something that already exists versus like reinventing the wheel. So if there's like a national, for example, let's say there's a, a mon like some kind of monitoring protocol for doing a, a monarch survey or something. I'm all about trying to pull that in and using that here. You know. Versus, we're going to come up with our own survey or monitoring protocol for monarchs. Well, if all this work's been done in the states, is someone making sure that the winter grounds stay? Well, see, there's 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 some political issues down there because apparently there's still illegal logging that goes on. Um, so so they they nest in sort of this uh, specific um, forest down there. I believe it's called the Oyamel fir forest. And there, and I believe most of that area is technically a preserve. It's protected, um, but you still have, I believe, like um, local people that still illegally log the area, cut the trees down, and it's it's one of these issues where we can do everything that we possibly can up here, but if the wintering grounds aren't protected, it's not going to do any good. So I, I don't really have an answer for that. That's just a complex sort of socioeconomic issue. Another piece of the puzzle. It really is a very important one, yeah. hugely important. Um, so you've got like groups like uh, the World Wildlife Fund are trying to work with the Mexican government. Um, there's uh, there's a group called Monarch Watch. Uh, they do uh, like they'll provide like um, milkweed seedlings to different people. Um, they also have uh, they also have this thing where they're called monarch way stations. Well, they'll they'll uh, teach you how to set up kind of like a little like a garden, basically for like monarchs to stop over, and kind of refuel as they migrate. Um, so they're they're working with the Mexican government, but it's it's a challenge for sure. Well, and then with the federal government, I'm assuming with right of ways, there's probably regulations. <laughs> And there, with that there is, and you, then you have sort of issues where um, you know the public wants to see a nice manicured right of way, just like a lawn. You know, it's like everybody wants a very nice, clean, manicured lawn, but that's not beneficial to pollinators. You know, they want they like a messy lawn with flowers in it. You know, <laughs> so it's same kind of thing. And and um, you know, I I do think that there is interest from these. Um, transportation agencies to uh, you know participate to the extent that they can you know alter their mowing um, to where they're not mowing like all the flowers when they're blooming or mowing all the milkweeds when they're blooming and um, so I've noticed signs but I don't know if that's ODOT or if it's something else that says I think a lot of those signs are from Kristen Baum okay there's the one on like Highway 51 mm -hmm. yeah yeah I think she has pl research plots Okay, that Actually, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So. I couldn't recall if I had seen one on 35. It must be something else that looks similar on 35 that I've seen between here and Guthrie. Mm -hmm. I'll have to look, pay attention next time. Yeah, it's, so it's, uh, I, I think that she tries to kind of, 
I mean, the nice thing about milkweeds is they're they're a perennial plant, so they come back essentially in the same spot every year. And so you kind of you know where a milkweed is. You can find easily find it, you know, versus like annual plants that just sort of pop up wherever. Well, when you're discussing this type of thing with the farmers, does that become an issue too? They don't want they don't want milkweed. Cattle well, you know, I haven't there. actually met with any private landowners about monarchs, so um, that's a good question. Um, do you, you know, anticipate? Huh? Do you anticipate? I, you know, I, I, I have suggested having like maybe a field day or something, maybe some regional field days, um, you know, working with some different groups. Another group that's helping out with the Monarch Plan is a group called Quail Forever. And so they're like a, like a, a non-profit organization that's very focused on, traditionally has been focused on um, bringing back numbers of bob white quail, but they've gotten very interested in participating in restoring pollinator habitat because once again, it's sort of like a native habitat issue. Which I think is great because with landowners, a lot of landowners have an interest in, I want to bring the quail back. They don't really, they, they may care less about the prey chicken or the monarch, but if you can get them to restore native grass or prairie or bob whites, well, that's going to benefit species like prey chicken and monarch and everything else that would live in the ecosystem. So you just got to figure out what makes a landowner tick and, you know. <laughs> Jump on that, capitalize on that. Well, you've been doing this particular job for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. Five years, looking forward five years, what do you think? It's on the, on the horizon. Like with me career-wise or in this position, what I'll be working on? Any of it, yeah. I don't know, I mean, I, I feel like I get, I get busier. Um, and I don't anticipate getting less busy. I mean, there's always going to be species that I'm going to be working on. There's always going to be species. I'm, I'm always going to be. So I sort of like, there's sort of like two components of my job. There is working with the Fish and Wildlife Service on recovery of listed species. Then there is the other side of getting information on species that are under review for listings. So, so trying to address those problems to preclude the need to list species and then also working with the service on what are data gaps or, or you know, what steps we need to take to recover species. And uh, I, I just, I anticipate there's, there's always going to be a lot of species to work on, you know, because we are still a small program. Um, and I just, there, there's so much to learn. Uh, landscape, landscape's constantly landscape's changing. constantly changing there's so much to learn because you know since I'm working with all taxa I'm working with freshwater mussels and fish and birds and reptiles and amphibians I mean there's just I mean I can't read enough you know there's just there's so much to, to, to keep up on um, so l looking out in the future I just I mean but but I but I but I love it you know I enjoy this I enjoy this job a lot, so I things will not slow down. They'll just speed up, and but hopefully we we can have some. I can have some successes. I can say, hey, you know, we were able to pull things together, and and for example, with the monarch, and actually get things done on the ground, and uh, bring numbers back, or at least contribute to bringing numbers back. I mean, I don't I don't feel like Oklahoma is going to bring numbers back, but we, as a piece of the of the puzzle can hopefully have a have a success story. Well, on a typical day, describe a typical day, if there is one. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I, I, I go to, um, okay, so, so one thing that I participate quite a bit in is, so, so the Fish and Wildlife Service has this um, process that's called a species status assessment. So it's kind of a new process that they've started where they, essentially pull together all the species experts, they pull together all of the states that are within the range of a species, and they, they, they kind of put together, they try to paint like a picture of, of uh, what's the species current status, where are all the populations, what is their, um, you, know, we, you know, we look at genetics and uh, relative abundance and uh, what we, you know, essentially, what, what do we know about its life history? It's just like, it's just like you know, we just hash it all out. And I participate, and I'm kind of our, our primary agency representative on those. So I'm, I'm almost always kind of working on one of those, uh, pulling together data, or participating in a conference call. 
um, to develop because basically a document is created when it's all said and done. It's like a species status assessment report. So I'll uh, you know provide edits on that or suggestions or input on that. Um, you know, I've always got, um, you know, so a lot of times those are conference conference calls. So it seems like I always have like a conference call to participate on. I go to a lot of meetings, a lot of times in the wintertime for, um, you know, because because field work is happening during spring and summer and fall, a lot of people schedule meetings during the wintertime. Okay. So when I think that things are going to be less busy, that's quite the opposite. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I, I go to meetings, participate in those kind of discussions. Um, I, uh, so for our, the section six grants, um, I, uh, I review all the reports for those. So all these, the principal investigators, so these researchers that are kind of heading up these projects will send me their reports. I'll review them and I submit them to our federal aid section. Um, and then during, during like this time of year, I'm doing a lot of uh, stuff in the field. Um, so last week I helped out with a, a, like a freshwater mussel collection. So I went to the Verdigree River and so there's a, a, um, a federally uh, endangered mussel that lives in that, that river. And so I went, and helped, I went with a, a couple of biologists. One of them was from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and we did a collecting. We collected some of them because they were going to take some of these, uh, they were uh, reproductive um, freshwater mussels and take them to a, uh, a lab to extract um, the larval mussels from them for like a propagation project to reintroduce them to like a different area up in Kansas. So that was one thing I helped out with. Um, uh, collectively our program, so myself and the other biologists in the program, we will do what we what are called wildlife diversity inventories. So we'll go to um, a, like a wildlife management area, and we will basically try to tally up everything that lives there. So we'll do like a reptile survey, we'll do amphibian surveys, we'll do a fish survey in any of the streams or ponds. We do bird surveys. When we'll we'll do what are called like point counts, where you get up early in the morning, you drive. A quarter mile, get out for five minutes. You just listen. You record every bird you hear. Mm. If you see them, you know you count like the number of birds. Um, and so, so we're always participating in one of those. We do those about do a trip like probably every month, every other month. We'll do like a trip, and then we'll every couple of years uh, we'll switch an area. So it usually takes us one to two years to do like one one wildlife management area, and we'll go to the next one. And so, we're, you know, and it basically after that, we have like a, a complete list of everything that lives there. We try to keep a plant list also of just the diversity of everything that lives there. So you have to be able to identify it by yeah. sound and sound. Yeah, it's, it's hard. You know, there's, there, there's a, a colleague of mine that I work with in my program. His name is, his name is Mark Howery, and he, um, he can identify, I mean, almost anything. And so he's a tremendous asset. Take pictures or recordings? Yeah, yeah, we take pictures. Um, yeah, lots of pictures, especially of, you know, plants that we're unsure about. Um, we have a, like, within our program, we have, like, a, an outreach person, so she will, um, like, post a lot of things that we're doing on social media. She'll write articles about a project we're working on and, like, put it in a newsletter. Um, the education aspect. Yeah, yes, yeah, so education aspect. Um, so I, 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 I help out quite a bit with the, um, the woodpecker project down in southeast Oklahoma. Um, and so I'll go down there and I'll help. Uh, so what they do is, is during, the, during the spring when the birds are nesting, I will actually climb up. So, so, these, so these woodpeckers nest in pine trees and they, they, they basically create a cavity that's about oh, 40 feet up a tree. So we will actually climb up the tree and when they have nestlings, we'll pull the nestlings out, we'll put little bands on their legs. And so that's, so we'll, I'll do that in the spring. And then in the fall, we will trap the adults and we will put like another set of bands on them, like colored bands to identify. So that's, that way we can like account for the birds that fledged, the chicks that made it for the year. And uh, we can also, you know, kind of check the adults, see how the adults are doing and if they're, you know, still around, hopefully alive. And so I'm involved in that. And then um, in the fall, spring and fall, I also help out with um, bat surveys sometimes. So there's, um, 
There's quite a few caves in eastern Oklahoma, like in the, in the Ozark area, and so that's where most of our endangered bats are, and so I'll help out with uh, some bat surveys on the Ozarks, and so there's, uh, in October, uh, we do a, uh, a, a track survey, so, and, and we go up to the panhandle of the state, and we uh, do surveys for a fox called the swift fox. So the swift fox is a species that um, used to be um, under review for a listing, it's threatened or endangered, and so we basically set up sort of like this monitoring protocol that we do, and so every year we go up um, to the Panhandle counties because they live like basically like in very dry areas, really short grass, and we'll we'll look for tracks along the roadway, and then we'll basically kind of and then and then we do it by uh, township, so. Um, we we'll, we'll like divide the county up into townships, and then we do like, every township we do a track survey. That so, takes time. It does, yeah. So there's like a group of us that go up and do that. So there's there's That's always fun, oh yeah, there's there's always something going on. But yeah, it's 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 it, there's never a dull moment. And you need different tools for different mm -hmm. things. And not afraid of heights if you have to climb. Right, yeah, you can't be afraid of heights. So yeah, there's just all kinds of different um, eco regions and. So you'd have binoculars would be part of your... Oh yes, yeah. Go to Never tools. leave home without them. Snake hook. Snake hook. Yeah, yeah, if you see a snake, you gotta... And what about waders? Yeah, waders. Um, you know, I don't get in the water much when it's cold. So typically I'm just putting on like sandals and shorts and jumping in, you know. But yeah, waders are... I probably should use waders more, but yeah, water moccasins. Well, I don't know if we have those in Oklahoma. Oh, we do have those. Yes, <laughs> we definitely have water moccasins. <laughs> so, your favorite part of the job? I wrap that. I really um, enjoy. Um, I enjoy. I enjoy helping our agency out, like people in the agency. So, so one of the things that I do is I, as I, um, I kind of help. So when when we do so any kind of project that we do that's federally funded, we have to basically comply with Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act. So like if we're doing any kind of, um, let's say we're going to do a prescribed burn on a wildlife management area, or we're going to build a fire break, or we're going to build a fence or a building, we have to basically kind of go through sort of an environmental compliance process. And so, I, I, so I help out with that, so I, I enjoy that. I enjoy uh, representing the agency in different working groups. I, you know, I try to represent the agency as professionally as I can, and I, I think partnerships are really important with other agencies. I, I think they're essential, you know, working with other, you know, landowners and groups and other natural resource agencies um, to try to, you know, pull our resources together to be more effective and have a, a greater impact on something. So I really enjoy that. I really enjoy, um, you know, just representing the agency and working with different groups on all these species. And of course, you know, I love biodiversity, so I'm always interested in all kinds of, all the different species that we're working with. And you mentioned you were currently working on a master's? I am, I am. So, um, so our agency has like a program where they'll, they'll um, offset part of the cost if, if you, you know, obtain a, uh, like a graduate level degree that kind of ties in with your job. So what I, I sort of, so, you know, the woodpeckers I mentioned, you know, I have a strong interest in those. And, you know, one of the things about that population down in southeast Oklahoma is, um, you know, we've been, we've been managing them for, for 20 plus years. And, and the, the population has stayed pretty small. You know, we've never, you know, the, the most that we have ever had is maybe 45 individual birds. And it's kind of stayed stable. And I basically want to know why is that? Well, why is this population not expanded? So I, I've kind of uh, designed this um, kind of a habitat selection study. And when I did that, I thought, well, I should, you know, turn this into a master's project. So I approached Scott Loss in the Natural Resource Ecology and Management Department. And I said, hey, you know, I'm mad. I'm with OWC. I want to do this. And would you take me on as a student? And he said, sure. So my supervisor checked off on it. So I... My, my plan is to develop this, you know, I've developed this habitat selection study and uh, I would like for it, and it's going to be basically, when it's all said and done, it's gonna be you know, a product of the agencies. 
So I just, I just think it's a good thing all around because I'd like to learn more about the species and figure out what, what is a limiting factor that's kept them from kind of expanding more. And then it'll just, it's just something that will potentially help our agency manage for this species. And so that's kind of how that started. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see. I'm going to kind of compare um, trees that they select versus trees they don't, figure out what attributes of these trees are different. You know, why, why do they select this tree versus that tree? Even though to us as humans, we're like, well, this tree's perfectly fine. Why don't they move in here? Well, they're not picking it for some reason. I'm trying to figure out why that is. Well, do they migrate? They don't. They don't. So they're here year-round. Are there other pockets of them across the country? There are. So there's actually some pretty big populations elsewhere. So historically, they were found all over, um, like, kind of the southeast United States. Um, you know, so historically, you had, like, millions of acres of uh, pine forests that were basically logged during the, kind of, the late 1800s. There, a lot of the old-growth trees were removed. Uh, what's interesting is the population down in southeast Oklahoma, they're on this area called the McCurtain County Wilderness Area, and it is, the, uh, it is almost all old growth trees, so it's like an area that has never been logged. And so the trees are just ancient on there, and uh, well, that's part of the reason why the woodpeckers are there. And uh, so it's, it's just a very unique um, area. Um, you know, it's a very special area. Because it, it's, it's the only tract of land that we own that is designated as a wilderness area. So everything else we have is a wildlife management area. This is a wilderness area, so it has like certain restrictions in place. Because I think we acquired it in 1912. I think it was originally Choctaw, the Choctaw tribe's land. So I don't know the history of how we acquired it, how the state acquired it, but I know we got it in 1912. But yeah, it's, um, it's essentially a kind of a, a pristine tract of forest that Pretty special, so. And they don't kill it as they, as they peck that wood. No, you know what's interesting is they only use live pine trees because they like the the sap, the resin that comes out. Because what 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 they use they use the resin as a as a to protect their cavity from snakes. See, so snakes can't climb over the over the sap as it comes down the trunk, and so when you see like these active trees. They, they hit, you'll see like the hole where the cavity is and you see the, like these little holes that they've kind of pecked around it and you'll just see all this gooey resin coming down. And um, it's the, the trees that they use are infected with this fungus inside their heartwood and it's called red heart fungus. And I do think that it slowly kills the tree over time. Uh, but they live, but the, the trees will live for years and years and years with these, you know, gaping holes and oozing resin and having this fungus. So it's kind of a fascinating relationship there. Another ecosystem then. Oh, it is. Yeah, it is for sure. And then and then the red cockaded woodpecker is a, it's a, what I would consider like a, a keystone species. So, I mean, when they abandon a cavity, other animals use it. So they're, so they're, they're very important in providing um, habitat for other species. And it's red. Head. It, it's red. It's red cockaded woodpecker. So, so from what I understand, a, a cockade is something that used to be like on um, maybe women's hats from way back when. And so the males have this little tiny red strip of feathers that you can barely see. And, and I guess that's where they got the name from, cockade. So it's red cockaded woodpecker. Oh, we wouldn't see those in Payne County. No. no, you wouldn't find them here, and I don't think they were ever historically here. I think that they were primarily in southeast Oklahoma, and there may have been a few kind of in the northeast where historically you had a lot more pines growing, but they, they really, you, you won't find them outside of um, like pine forest. They, they exclusively use pine. And your anticipated completion date? So, 2019. Not too far. Yeah, not too far. Um, so I'm going to start um, doing field work for the study here very soon. I'm going to be basically measuring several hundred trees, basically doing a diameter and height and how tall is the crown and just all kinds of forestry techniques to be using just to try to, and then I'm measuring um, kind of uh, random trees also to try to figure out what are the differences here. 
Sounds cool and fascinating. Yeah, all right. yeah. we'll see when it's all said and done. Look. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited. We've covered a lot. Is there anything else we need to touch on before we close out? I, I don't think so. I, I don't know. I just, um, I mean, I, I love my job and I get to do a lot of cool things. I'm very thankful for getting to do what I do. It sounds like you learn something new every day. I do. I learn a lot. Um, I, I just, I, I'm never bored. There's just so much work to be done. Um, and the computer is your friend. The computer is my friend. Um, I'm, you know, probably check my email too much. I probably work too much. I think my wife would say that I work too much, but I, you know. So is like, she an OSU grad? She's not. So, so she, no, she didn't go to OSU and she, um, she is a nurse, a home health nurse in Oklahoma City. So. That's well, interesting too, and it's. It is, yeah. So she. Um, she takes care of the humans, and you. She take does, care of the yeah. So I'll, yeah. So we'll talk about different things, and it's like we're both speaking like a foreign <laughs> language to the other. Um, but she's always been very supportive of my endeavors, my career. So you know, whenever I drug her off, well, actually, so so when I was uh, doing my internship down in Southwest Oklahoma, we were living apart. And then when I got the full, hired full time in Northwest Oklahoma, when I was working with the Prairie Chicken, that's when I had some. We relocated up there, and that's when my 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 oldest son had just been born then too. So it was sort of like this crazy time where we weren't making any money, and um, you know, my son was a baby, and we're living up there. We don't know anybody. We're moving away from the family. So it was. My wife was like, "What are you doing?" You know, and I'm like, "It'll be worth it." So, and it, and it all worked out. Yeah, those were the good old days. Yeah, too. they really were. Yeah, I mean, I mean, now we look back and you know, yeah, we enjoyed it. Yeah, you get by. Oh yeah. You get by. So. Well, it sounds like OSU's done done you well. It has. And, it's and done and me you, really well. It's done me really well. And you've done OSU well. So. <laughs> Thank you. Out. Well, I, that's all of my questions. I appreciate you coming in today. It's been fun. I appreciate you having me. I've enjoyed it. Thank you.